Hello again, dear students. We are now going to discuss the latter topics in our lecture outline in this session. And now, we come around to the topics we often shy away from talking about with our teen patients. Unfortunately, it is a reality that problems like this, as cited in this recent news article, of pregnancy rates rising especially in the less than 15-year-old age group, that we should be motivated to educate and counsel our adolescent patients and be confident as well and competent in these topics. In the Philippines, the YAFS or Young Adult Fertility Survey is the closest we have with regard data pertinent for our topics today. It summarizes information on a broad range of sexuality and reproductive health issues for Filipinos aged 15 to 24. Unfortunately, its latest version was still in 2013 and has yet to be updated. The key findings in this study include evidence of earlier coitarch or first sexual encounter before the age of 18 in Filipino youth. The younger teens are engaging more in unprotected sex, sexually transmitted illnesses or STIs are increasing, and so are teen pregnancy rates. A large part of this is attributable to the flux of the internet and how this has been widely and easily accessible to this generation and their social and environmental milieu. And the lack of education as well as absence of teen-friendly health facilities. These are all cited as causes. We recognize that there is an unmet need for education, support, and care for our teens in regard contraception. This is a sample video from the ADEPT module and is accessible online. O nga, buti na lang, alam ni Aling Carmina at sabihan tayo. At least hindi na tayo magpapabalik-balik pa sa center. Tara! Ayun na pala health center, oh! This DOH-led program reminds health workers of the proper approach as well as uniqueness of teen consults to stress confidentiality and a non-judgmental approach. Good morning! Ako nga pala si Aling Kulching. BHW ako dito. Paano ko kayo matulungan? Ma'am, kasi ano po, may kukonsulta lang po sana ako. Ay, sige, sige. Halika dito, Iha. Dito tayo magsalat ng form. Okay po. O, oh, Iha, ganito magsalat ng form, ha? Pagkatapos mo dyan, habang naghihintay tayo kay Dr. Hilen, kasi may inasikaso pang pasyente, kukuhaan kita ng vital signs, okay? Sige po ha, salamat po. Pwede din pala magpa-check up dito mga teenagers. Akala ko mga babies, buntis, at mga matatanda lang. Ay oo naman, nagkakasakit din naman sila. Habang naghihintay kayo, pwede kayong magbasa muna. Tapos kung may katanungan kayo, sabihan nyo lang ako ha. Good morning. Ako si Dr. Helen. Upo kayo. Um, sino si Adel? Ako po si Adel at ano naman po si Ate Lisa. Jameson ko po. O iha, bata ka pa. 16 ka lang, tama? Si Ate Lisa mo ilang taon na ba? 23 na po ako. Mm -hmm. Mabuti naman at nasamahan mo si Adel ngayon. Um, nasan ba ang mami at daddy mo, iha? Nasa abroad po kasi parents ko, OFW po sila doon. Si Ate Lisa po, isa po siya sa kasama namin sa bahay. Hmm, ah, ganun ba? O oh, sige, uh, explain ko lang na medyo iba ang setup ng clinic kapag teenager ang pasyente. Una, kakausapin ko muna kayong dalawa. Pero Lisa, mamaya, palalabasin kita ha, para makapag-usap kami ni Adair ng kami lang. Tapos, tatawagin din kita. Okay po, Doc. Pero kung meron pa kayong mga tanong o gustong sabihin, huwag kayo mahiya. Gusto ko lang ipaalam sa inyo na ang pag-uusapan natin dito ay confidential. Um, ano ba ang pagkakaintindi mo pag sinabing confidential? 
yung parang private po, yun lang atin-atin lang? Mm, tama ka dyan. Atin-atin lang. Ibig sabihin, walang ibang makakaalam ng pag-uusapan natin. Mari lang sabihin sa mga pagkakataon na ang pagsasabi nito ay uh, makaiiwas sa iyo at sa ibang tao sa panganib o kaya ay makapagbibigay daan sa pagtulong sa iyo, lalo na at ikaw ay isang menor de edad. Uh, pero huwag kang matakot. Bago namin sabihin sa ibang tao, eh, papaalam namin sa iyo. Naunawaan mo ba ito? Opo. Okay. Oh, may tanong ka pa tungkol dito? Wala naman na po. Um, so, Iha, um, paano ba kita matutulungan? Uh, pwede mo bang sabihin sa akin kung bakit ka nandito? Kasi po, Dok, delayed yung mens ko. Ngayon na ba nangyari ito o talagang hindi regular ang mens mo? Hindi po talaga regular pero ngayon po kasi medyo matagal po siya dumating. May alam ka bang naging sakit si Adele? Hmm, wala naman po. Malusog naman po siya. Mm -hmm. O sige Ate Lisa, gaya ng napag-usapan natin kanina, uh, excuse mo muna kami ni Adele ha. Doon ka muna sa labas maghintay para makapag-usap kami, okay? Sige po, sa labas na lang pa ako maghihintay. Okay ka na dito, Adel? Sige, Ate Lisa, salamat. Adel, meron ako mga tanong na tinatanong sa lahat ng pasyente. Um, yung ibang mga tanong may pagkamaselan o sensitibo. Uh, pero huwag ka mag-alala uh, na sa iyo yun kung gusto mong sagutin. Makakatulong kung sasagutin mo. Uh, pinapaalala ko lang ulit na ang lahat ng pag-uusapan natin dito ay confidential. Maliban na lang sa mga sitwasyon na binanggit ko kanina. Okay ba yun sa iyo? Apo, Dok. Maraming mga teenagers, uh, patulad mo, ang kinakabahan at natatakot kapag nagpapatingin sa amin. Um, pero natutuwa naman ako at nagpapasalamat kasi naging totoo ka sa mga sinabi mo. Uh, ngayon naman, uh, magsisimula na tayo sa kompletong physical examination. Okay ba yun sa'yo? Masakit po ba yun? Ah, hindi. Um, papakinggan ko lang ang puso at baga mo. Tapos, iti-check natin ang chan mo at iba pa. Okay ba yun? Um, gusto mo bang isama si Ate Lisa mo pag ileksamen kita? Hindi na po, Dok. Okay lang po. May papagawa akong mga lab test. Kukuhanan ka ng konting dugo at magbibigay ka din ng ihi. Si-check natin para makasigurado tayo kung ano ang dahilan kung bakit delayed ang mens mo. Uh, ibalik mo sa akin ang resulta pag meron na. Tingnan natin kung kailangan mo pang ma-refer sa ibang doktor. Pero ngayon, re-resetahan kita ng vitamina. May mga tanong ka pa ba? Wala naman na po. Sige, uh, gusto kong kausapin si Ate Lisa mo para alam din niya ang mga instructions na sinabi ko sa'yo. Hindi ko babanggitin yung mga confidential in na information na pinag-usapan natin. Okay? Apo, Dok. Okay. Uh, sige, okay, Adele. Uh, salamat sa kooperasyon mo. Kita tayo ulit sa Tuesday, ha? Salamat po. The Reproductive Health Bill and the Education of the General Public on Sexual Health and the Prevention of STIs and Intensified Provision of Contraception had a rocky start. It was a fight between legislation and the religious sector, but because of that careful implementation and analysis of limitations were made and loopholes of the bills were remedied. We must make it clear that no abortifacients are to be prescribed at all. Thanks to the RH Bill, sex education is now part of the curricula of both public and private elementary and high schools. 
The DOH is actively working to improve health facilities, services, and personnel to address adolescents and especially their RH needs, and especially on contraception. Guidelines recommend that teens should first visit a gynecologist between 13 and 15 years old, unless necessary at an earlier age. This visit aims to establish rapport, educate the patient, and parents or guardian on healthy sexual development and provide routine preventive services. Cervical cancer screening should be made available at age 21 onwards. Aside from encouraging abstinence, part of the patient education for teens is contraception. There are tires ranking contraceptives into the most versus the least effective as follows. Note that IUDs and implants are actually approved for use for teens. Note also how the most common used ones known to the general public, including withdrawal and calendar-based methods, are tire tree. The most affordable and convenient for common use remains the condom and pills, and second, injectables. These are provided free by health centers with counseling nationwide. By virtue of the Philippine RH bill, if the patient is a minor though, consent is required, given either by the teen's parent or guardian, who is at least 18 years or older. Many of the other methods mentioned here, like the sponge or vaginal ring or patch, are not readily available in our country. However, it is hoped that teens will at least use a form of contraception during their sexual debut and hence prevent unwanted pregnancy and untoward complications. In the simplest explanation, contraceptives work in the following four general principles. One, work as a barrier. Two, inhibit ovulation. And three, inhibit the transit of sperm by making the cervical mucus thick. Or four, making the endometrium unfit for implantation. Several noteworthy points about contraception will be mentioned here as they will be discussed extensively and in detail in your other subjects, especially in gyne and OB. LARC or long-acting reversible contraceptive methods are said to be low maintenance and ideal for the forgetful, busy, and distracted teen. In copper IUDs, the copper ions released into the uterine cavity inhibits sperm transport and prevents implantation. It can be safely used in the leprous women and its effectivity is 10 years. It does not increase the risk of infertility. Whereas the LNG or levonorgestrel IUD inhibits transport of sperm by thickening cervical mucus inhibits sperm survival, and suppresses the endometrium. It is effective for 3 to 5 years. Note that it is best to do an STD or STI screen before IUD placement. There are several versions of hormonal contraception, either injectables, implants, pills, rings, or skin patches and contain either single or multiple hormonal components. Let us mention specially the progestin-only methods. DMPA injections readily available in the health center, the pill, and the LNG IUD. Progestin, as a component of these methods, work by thickening the cervical mucus, blocking the sperm entry, and inducing endometrial atrophy, hence amenorrhea and lesser menses. Implants and injectables suppress ovulation. These are safe for use in those with estrogen contraindications such as hypercoagulable states, a history of myocardial infarction or stroke, an active liver disease, replaced cardiac valves, or a history of thromboembolism and smoking which is actually quite rare in teens, but we should be aware of those contraindications. The combined oral contraceptives are mostly available as pills in the mechanism being suppression of ovulation, cervical mucus thickening, 
and induction of atrophy of the endometrial lining. We must also educate our patients what to do if they miss a dose, including catch-up doses. A use of a backup method temporarily, which is often done for 7 days after restarting. And the use of emergency contraception. Be ready to answer your patient's questions also regarding the side effects of these common contraceptive methods. The EC will not induce abortion nor is teratogenic. Plan B or anytime pills are not available in the Philippines. You'll be surprised though that it is available online Shopping. but without an FDA approval. Emergency contraception is most effective when used immediately but can be used for up to 5 days after unprotected intercourse or contraception failure. The available ECs are the following, but the modified use of contraceptive pills or the USP method is also possible. Remember that there are only certain pill brands that can be used for this purpose. The use of dual protection is encouraged as it prevents both pregnancy and STIs. Fertility-based methods like calendar or symptothermic method or fertility beads or cervical mucus techniques should also be discussed if that's what the patient and the consenting parents or guardians like. However, since most early periods of a teen are irregular and anovulatory, Advice to use it with caution as it has a high failure rate. For those teens who were pregnant and have given birth, pure breastfeeding for until 6 months of age of the newborn without resumption of menses will afford natural contraception. Remember that no technique is 100% fail-proof but combination guarantees better rates making responsible sex education available in schools and media, and making health facilities accessible to those who need it are our goals. It does not have to lead up to desperate measures such as this. More than 500 babies are born to Filipino teenage mothers daily, and not surprisingly, we have the second highest teen pregnancy rates in Southeast Asia. So, it is important to establish a supportive and informative teen pregnancy friendly clinic or facility or hospital. As with any prenatal checkup, the signs of pregnancy are confirmed and the age of gestation determined. Remember that these teen patients may still be angry, confused, in denial, and afraid, or all of the above. They will usually come for a sudden general checkup to disguise their pregnancy concerns. Hence, an unhurried, non judgmental, open ended questioning and approach, and a lot of patients are needed. You will want to confirm the suspicion of pregnancy. How soon? At best, over the counter urine tests that detect beta HCG may turn positive on the day of the missed period or seven days after fertilization for more expensive clinic available serum pregnancy tests. A pelvic ultrasound, although not commonly used to detect pregnancy, can detect the gestational sac at five to six weeks from the last menstrual period. A complete PE must still be done and this can reveal the following changes. Prenatal counseling should be tailored to the teen's concerns, which include legal intervention in the case of rape or abuse, treating comorbids, and sexually transmitted illnesses if present, discussion of the options of including the father in the process if so desired, addressing depression, and the potential for options of adoption after the birth of the child. Prenatal medications and precautions are emphasized. We should try as much as possible to help the teen and her family and social circles to identify factors leading up to the pregnancy and how these can be avoided, mediated, 
or solved. Please see the checklist attached for our guide in the questionnaire as addendum to the lecture on this checklist. Constant follow-up of the pregnant teen is necessary as they are at high risk for medical complications themselves as well as their babies. Be especially vigilant to abuse and refer it to the proper authorities. And this follow-up should continue up until the birth of the baby. About 50% of all teen mothers will experience postpartum depression. Be tempted to resume drugs in some and even get pregnant shortly from a period of about a few months to two years from the birth of the first baby, for which the outcomes are even poorer. We cannot overemphasize how preventive programs are really necessary. It is a fact that sex education and teaching about contraception does not lead to increased sexual activity. Let us teach our teens resilience, self-confidence, life skills, and not to give in to peer pressures. The SLU Hospital is now undergoing major expansion and reconstruction as you may have seen. And one of the new centers that we have started to put up is the WCPU or Women and Child Protection Unit. This center receives referrals for abused and sexually assaulted women and children. In teens, certain factors make them vulnerable, such as the use of alcohol and drugs, being an LGBT, intellectual disability or not finishing education, or being a dropout, developmental delays, or history of parental abuse. Sex trafficking and cyber sex are very common problems encountered due to the advent of the availability and commonality of internet in our community. Unfamiliar environments like moving to a new school or being institutionalized are also included as predictive factors. Developmentally, teens have a strong desire to explore, be adventurous and independent, but at the same time, they are naive and not yet fully capable of making mature decisions in unfamiliar situations and unable to say no or stop unwanted actions. The perpetrators of teen rape in the majority of times are acquaintances of the teen, like the stepfather, uncle, or mother's boyfriend. Less common but gradually increasing are date, gang, and stranger rapes, usually in the setting of drugs called drug-facilitated sexual assault. These examples are rohypnol, flunitrazepam, ecstasy, or gamma-hydroxybutyric acid, and ketamine, among others. Alcohol is still the most common drug associated with sexual victimization. Remember that as medical personnel, we are responsible to report these even if there is a low level of suspicion detected. The CPU and the police or NBI should have competent personnel and must be well equipped for examining and interviewing a rape victim. This should be done in a comprehensive, non-threatening manner. The procedure should include an interview, a physical examination, and laboratory tests in an attempt, in attempt to identify or confirm the perpetrator and medical and psychological consequences of the deed. These include detection of pregnancy, detecting drugs, administration of emergency contraception, treating STIs if present, and administration of prophylactic medications. The two most common identified STIs involved in rape are gonorrhea and chlamydia. But take note that the majority of STIs are asymptomatic and may involve long-term follow-up if to be detected and subsequently treated. So the absence of infection does not rule out rape. Outside the rape situation, the common STIs in adolescents in the U.S. is HPV, and the most prevalent are HSV infections. 
Unfortunately, we have no comprehensive nor recent Philippine data. The identified risk factors for STIs are early sexual contact and other atypical sexual practices, especially with the increased incidence of MSM or men having sex with men. STIs have a higher propensity to affect adolescents due to the following physical characteristics. If you remember in histology, the area of the squamo-columnar junction or ectopy in the cervical os represents a unique vulnerability in adolescent females before it involutes. Behavioral characteristics also give them the concept of invulnerability or lack of anticipatory thinking and decision making. And social situations including poverty, the presence of abuse and violence, being partners with a much older male and lack of health-seeking behaviors are cited as factors. A short discussion of common STIs follows dividing them into the location of the manifestation and the type of the lesion. Note that urethritis and UTIs in males who have a sexual history are STIs unless proven otherwise. The most common etiologies are chlamydia and gonorrhea, and other non-gonococcal agents are included. Epididymitis, again most often associated with STIs, will present with scrotal swelling and tenderness, sometimes with a hydrocele and a urethral discharge. Testicular torsion is a close differential that must be ruled out. Vaginitis, on the other hand, is defined as infection of the vaginal mucosa coupled with vaginal discharge. Consider these etiologies for bacterial vaginosis, candidiasis, and trichomoniasis. The type of discharge can be suggestive of the etiology and microscopy will be confirmatory. Cervicitis, most are actually asymptomatic. This can be confirmed by a swab test revealing a mucopurulent exudate coming from the cervical os and an extremely friable endocervix that bleeds with gentle application of the swab. PID or pelvic inflammatory disease, on the other hand, is one of the impressions and the teen usually consults for dyspareunia, which can be confirmed with cervical wiggling tenderness. There is often fever, a discharge, and urinary symptoms. Laboratories such as these will confirm the suspicion for PID, particularly finding the fluid-filled fallopian tubes or even endometritis by biopsy. The following microbes can be identified as causes. With regard genital ulcers, the most common ulcerative STI is herpes. Classically, it is the HSV2 that is isolated, but it's not unusual to find HSV1. Remember that it is a lifelong infection and has a tendency for recurrences. Its appearance is typically a shallow and painful ulcer. HSV serology and culture are the preferred diagnostics and not the chank smear. The lesion of a primary syphilis is characterized by a chancre that is painless and usually single. Diagnostics include finding the treponemal spirochetes under dark field microscopy or serological tests that can differentiate between an active and past infections. A chancroid, on the other hand, being a purulent and painful type of lesion, usually multiple with uninjurated borders in a purulent base with associated significant lymph adenopathy that may rupture and form a bubo is a typical picture. Gram stain may reveal the Haemophilus ducreyi, but culture is more sensitive. Other genital lesions. In the U.S. where STI screening is often offered for free, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or NHANES, found that a third of females aged 14 to 24 
were already actively infected with HPV. Types 16 and 18 are of extreme importance as they can cause cervical cancers. These manifest with warts and other cervical abnormalities in females. Other lesions of note are molluscum contagiosum, condyloma latum, pediculosis, and scabies. Other STDs discussed elsewhere but important to consider are hepatitis B and HIV. Diagnostics Microscopy is very useful. A common flow chart of decision-making for a female presenting with genital discharge is illustrated here. A purulent endocervical discharge is tested and cultured for Neisseria and Chlamydia. If it is, however, white and flocular, that is less than 4.5 in pH, and negative on WIFS test or addition of KOH to reveal a fishy odor in the presence of mycelia on wet preparations is probably a yeast infection, whereas positive results in the WIFS test need further testing. If clue cells are found with a few white cells, then bacterial vaginosis is present. Trichomoniasis is straightforward with the identification of the organism on wet mounts. Remember that not all STIs are symptomatic, and discharges may not always be readily visible. The most ideal test to do, as cited by our reference, is a nucleic acid amplification test, or NAAT, which will test for various STDs, and a variety of specimens are possible to use. Remember to treat the partner or partners of your patient as well. Always take some time to give patient education and for HPV and Hepatitis B, encourage vaccination. It is recommended as routine. Unfortunately, in the Philippines, there is no free government-provided HPV vaccine. The treatment of choice for each etiology is cited here. Certainly, it is necessary sometimes to combine several treatments as multiple STIs do occur. Be assured that I will not be asking you the dosages of these specific medications in the exams. Okay? This is the treatment for scabies and crab louse or pubic lice. And for anogenital warts. Cervical, urethral, intraanal, and vaginal warts. And herpes. With that being said, I would like to remind you of your TikTok assignment for adolescent peds. TikTok is used by a lot of teens. It is considered viral. Influencers reach millions of followers worldwide and viral videos reach hundreds of thousands of likes and views. Sure, it can be funny and entertaining, but we can see how TikTok has that potential as a tool for health education and means for encouraging teens to seek advice and treatment from the correct and reliable medical personnel and facilities. Let's invade the TikTok world and communicate with the teen public. Let's correct the misinformation and myths we see here. Let's put in good vibes and positivity. Who knows, your TikTok video may inspire some of them and even save a life. More details on your video assignment video. On the matter of teen depression, I am certain that it has been lectured to you extensively and separately, especially in your psych modules, but I would like to give you a copy of the depression and suicide evaluation tools that we use in the hospital, OPD, and clinical practice. These are the PHQ-9 and the Columbia CSSRS or Suicidality Scale. And these will help you in the formal assessment and referral of your patients. The PDF files are also attached with this lecture. So thank you for your kind attention. And wherever you are, good morning, good noon, good evening. God bless. Be safe. Bye.